first do no harm. In tech, they say, move fast and break things. That's a conflict. You know, we're in the middle of a mental health pandemic. Ordinary people think you gotta be crazy to see a psychiatrist. Now that's impossible. But, but somehow AI figured out how to do it. He advised startups in health tech not to hire senior doctors. And this is gonna be earth shattering if we can get it right. Mental health illnesses are becoming destigmatized. Access is a big problem. Hey everyone. Um... Here's a short teaser for today's interview. Hair loss, skin problems, Viagra. And you would ask me, how is this a health tech channel? Where the technology is? So keep watching this episode to find out. And also subscribe to our channel to not to miss any of important digital health content. And I'm really happy to introduce to our today's guest. His name is Daniel Lieberman. Hi, Daniel. Hi, nice to be here. And I'm really excited to talk about a startup that is uh, one of the leaders in mental health issues, of course. But before that, I'll ask you to give us a short introduction and tell us a bit about your background. Sure. So I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I went to medical school and did my training at New York University. So I got to live in New York City for eight years. And then I went to George Washington University back in 1996. And I was there for 26 years. Uh, more recently, uh, earlier this year, I decided it was time for something new. And so I left and I ended up as the uh, SVP of mental health for Hims and Hers. Exciting. Tell us, lead us through that process, decision making process. How you decided to go to the tech space? Yeah. So I've always been fascinated by technology. I guess I was born a geek. I was programming skateboarder games in basic on a mainframe when I was in high school. And um, I, I recognized early on in my psychiatric career that there are problems with the way mental health care is delivered in this country. Access is a big problem. There is a lot of illness and very few doctors who are able to take care of it. Another problem is that mental health care can be very, very expensive. And I think that technology and automation has the potential to help with that to some degree. And finally, there are some fantastic mental health providers out there. There are also some who are honestly not that good. And so the uniformity of care is not what I think it should be. And I think technology has the potential to ensure that everybody gets standard of care treatment. And even beyond that, as the technology improves, they get something personalized for their exact needs. So yeah, we're definitely gonna talk about hymns and herds later on, but I want to ask you, can you give a short kind of overview of mental health situation in the U.S. right now? Yeah. You know, we're in the middle of a mental health pandemic. And I think that a lot of it is because of the COVID crisis that we had, uh, where people's lives were turned upside down. They were cut off from their normal forms of support and everything just became frightening and confusing. I don't think that's all of it. Uh, as you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, there are a lot of changes that are taking place in our society, and I think people feel absolutely disoriented. And I think the third factor is that um, mental health illnesses are becoming destigmatized, which is an absolutely wonderful thing. It used to be you never ever spoke about mental health. It was shameful. It was a weakness. Now, we're not where we need to be yet, but we're getting there. People are coming forward. They're saying, hey, this is a medical illness, just like any other illness, heart disease, cancer, etc. cetera. And um, it can be devastating to people's lives, but treatment is extremely effective. So I think that we're seeing a lot more interest in mental health care. At the same time, we don't have the resources to address it. Additionally, the healthcare system in general, I think, is largely broken. We don't know how to finance it. It's incredibly expensive, and yet at the same time, it's an essential part of um, what it takes to have a healthy population. And so historically and presently, insurance companies have not treated psychiatrists well. They've really tied our hands behind our backs, requiring us to get prior authorization for ordinary procedures, and um, really not paying us what we are worth. 
And that's led to a couple of things. It's led to young doctors choosing other specialties because psychiatry is not appealing. It's also led to many, many psychiatrists deciding that they're not gonna work within the insurance company's authority. And so of all the specialties, psychiatry has the most practitioners who don't accept insurance. That makes it very, very expensive for people to get healthcare when they can't use the insurance they're already paying through their employment. Okay. Uh, when I was an exchange student back in 2004, we were taught that uh, number one death cause among youth and young adults is uh, drunk driving. But it's still, I think it's still, still number one, but I think the numbers went much, much down and multiple reasons for that. Safer cars, but also I think government spent federal and state government spent lots of resources educating people not to drink alcohol while you're driving. And now I see that suicide rates are tremendously up for the past few years. Do you know of any initiatives that government does in order to improve that issue? There are initiatives, and in my opinion, they're largely useless. Um, educating the public when it comes to behavior change doesn't work. And we know this with drug abuse. There was uh, an enormous amount of money spent by the government trying to reduce drug abuse among young people. And they tried a whole bunch of different things. And interestingly, what they found was that educating children about the dangers of drug use increased the rate. Because adolescents are stupid, right? And, and so someone comes on and starts talking about these drugs, they're like, gosh, I should give that a try. This sounds really, really interesting, and I don't believe that the risks will apply to me. Uh, same with smoking cessation. Uh, you've, uh, everybody's seen the advertisements, um, the warnings, and they do absolutely nothing. The things that help are societal pressure. We don't see a lot of smoking these days, and that's because it's simply become unacceptable mm -hmm. from a cultural standpoint, and that works. Changes in the culture work. The other reason I think we're seeing a lot less drunk driving is because of companies like Uber, rideshare companies. Now it's really easy not to drive drunk. So I don't think the solution to behavioral problems or, or these big problems is government intervention. I think it's the private sector. I think Uber has done more for drunk driving than billions of dollars spent by the government trying to educate people. That's really interesting. And I guess, uh, as you mentioned, Uber is a tech company and more tech companies and startups come into mental health uh, space. Uh, you mentioned that there's definitely less stigma and discrimination against these topics, but I think it's still, for people, it's much more comfortable just to use their phone and get some help just for the phone so nobody sees them uh, because of the, that stigma. So how exactly tech is coming in to help with mental health? Yeah, so right, the stigma is decreasing, but it's going to take a long, long time for that to get internalized. And for people to be able to say, okay, I feel comfortable with it. I'm going to go to my doctor and say, hey, I'm depressed. People don't want to do that yet. So um, what Hims and Hers is doing is we are making mental health care available from a person's cell phone. Um, we use an asynchronous model, which means that the communication is largely via messaging. Um, if somebody's in a crisis, of course, uh, the provider will reach out to them in real time. But otherwise, it's gonna be on my messaging, and, and that means there's no appointment necessary. It, yeah, it's hard to go into a doctor's office and say I'm depressed. It's also hard to pick up the phone and simply make an appointment. Um, and as anybody knows who's interacted with the healthcare system, that appointment could easily be a month or two away. And um, when people are depressed, they need care right away. The chairman of uh, the Department of Psychiatry at NYU, where I trained, used to say that ordinary people think you gotta be crazy to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> um, it's absolutely the last thing you do. And so people wait and wait and wait and wait. They say, I can handle this. They say, it's gonna go away by itself. Um, usually it does not. And by the time they call, they're in bad shape. Uh, at GW, we'd have people calling and say, hey, I need to see a psychiatrist today or tomorrow. And we ask them, all right, how long has this been going on? They say, oh, about six months. And, and so they could have called us six months ago and, and we could have gotten them in a couple of weeks, but they need to be seen right away. So with an asynchronous model, you can be seen essentially right away. 2 a.m. in the morning, 
you pick up your phone, you decide it's time to get help, you fill out an online evaluation, and usually within a matter of hours, you have a response from the provider. Interesting. Uh, you, you covered the, the mental part of hims and hers. Just a short brief uh, in, uh, over you, like what does the company do? in general, not just mental health issues. Yeah, so we started out offering treatment for erectile dysfunction, uh, prescribing uh, generic forms of Viagra and Cialis, things like that, and also hair loss. These are the conditions that are stigmatized and um, most, uh, most commonly seen. Uh, it was originally just for men. A company was called Four Hymns, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a smashing success. Uh, these illnesses are very, very widespread. People do not want to talk about them with their doctor. And it was so liberating for people to finally have a way to access effective treatments without having to go through the embarrassment. And at some point, the, the company has telehealth as one of the services, right? But I assume it's still like not, not the major uh, revenue stream. Yep, that's correct. That's correct. We're really focused on asynchronous care. And the reason for that is that it maximizes provider efficiency. One of the biggest problems we face is provider shortage. And asynchronous care allows providers to see perhaps twice as many patients as they could otherwise, because it's a very, very focused interaction. What you don't get is you don't get the human element of it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when you go see a doctor, you chit chat and, and it's nice. And, and there are advantages to that. Uh, we give up a little bit of that, but with our increased efficiency, we can offer immediate care at a much lower price. You mentioned that the mental health problems even raised uh, dramatically during the pandemic. And telehealth, of course, went up with the pandemic. But now we see overall that the numbers are going kind of down, but probably not in the mental health uh, because you still want to go to a psychiatrist online, do you? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody I know in psychiatry is doing primarily telehealth visits. Mm -hmm. And it's really for convenience. Uh, when I was seeing patients in person, they basically had to take a half day off from work to see me. They had to drive through DC traffic, which is no fun. They had to pay $15 for parking. They had to sit in the uh, waiting room for a little while. Um, with telehealth, they take 20 minutes off from work and they see me right from their desk or, or they were when I was doing it that way. So, um, you know, psychiatrists don't need to do physical exams. We don't do a lot of touching, right. really none, right. <laughs> right? And so telehealth is perfect for psychiatry and I don't think it's gonna go away. Uh, but do you think it's, it's still gonna go up within the next years? Boy, I think it's, it's pretty maxed out right now. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that um, during the pandemic, it was close to 100%, and I don't think a lot of people went back to being in person. There are some procedures that have to be in person. We give long-acting injectable medications that only have to be given once a month, and of course, that has to be done in person. Um, sometimes we give intravenous medications, for example, ketamine. But the vast majority of our treatment involves talking to people, writing prescriptions, sending it to a pharmacy, and there's no reason why that needs to be done in person. All right. I know that one of the biggest problems for mental health applications is engagement. Uh, how does HIMS and HERS solve this issue? And what would your be recommendations for other startup founders in mental health uh, space? Engagement is hard. Engagement, I think, and retention are, mm -hmm. are related to one another. And it is harder in telehealth, and particularly in asynchronous, where you never see your doctor face to face. And you work with a team of providers, and so you might be seeing different people. And that gets in the way of establishing what we call a therapeutic alliance. And that's really the essence of engagement and retention. So what we do is we encourage our providers to not only address the, um, the dry basics, these are your symptoms, this is your diagnosis, here's your treatment, but really to try to form a human relationship with patients. When patients do their intake, they usually tell us about what's going on in their life, the challenges they're facing. A beloved pet died. I recently had a breakup. I, I lost my job. And we encourage the providers to address that, the human aspect of things, because it is more challenging to develop that therapeutic alliance. What other challenges do you see? Other challenges that we see is that we, this is new, and 
we need to get experience treating the simple cases before we can treat the complex cases. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of our evaluation is making sure that somebody is safe and appropriate for our remote asynchronous model. And as a result, we have to screen a lot of people out. We don't treat drug abuse. We don't treat bipolar disorder. We don't treat psychotic illnesses. And it can be upsetting for patients when they say, oh my God, I found a place where I can get treatment. You know, I've been making a million phone calls. Nobody can take me. I don't have insurance. I can't afford it. I found something. And then we have to say, hey, our, our model isn't ready for this. We're only treating the simple cases. A few weeks ago, you announced, uh, the company announced Med Match. Yes. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, I am so excited about Med Match. That's one of the main reasons I decided to join this company because it was so incredibly exciting. So, um, Med Match is eventually going to be applied, the AI behind Med Match can be applied to all of the different categories of illnesses we treat. We're starting with mental health mm -hmm. because, um, in my opinion, that's the most exciting part. How, how does it work? Yeah, so let me tell you the problem. Okay, here's the problem. We've got all kinds of antidepressants, right? The, the most popular class of antidepressant is the SSRI, and, and there's about half a dozen of them that are commonly used, and these include things like Zoloft and Prozac and um, Lexapro. When you look at the clinical trials, they all work about the same. When you put them head-to-head -head in large groups of people, there's none that are superior. And this is true of all of the antidepressants. There is no magic one that's better than the other. But when you give it to an individual, they can do amazingly well on one and horrible on another that looks exactly the same on paper. And we don't know why. So what doctors will do is they'll talk with patients, they'll gather information, and then they'll come up with what we call a reasonable, uh, a menu of reasonable options. It's not going to point us to one drug because you know, we can't put people in a brain scanner or do a blood test and find out what's exactly the right drug for them. We can rule some out. We can say, well, this class is probably best, but then we're faced with a number of choices. What clinicians will do is they'll either use their intuition or they'll present that menu of reasonable options to the patient and say, what would you like to try? And, and really, this is not a whole lot better than throwing a dart against a dartboard. Now, the problem here is magnified by the fact that it usually takes a couple of trials before the doctor and patient find the medication that's right for them. Only 30% of people get all better with the first medication they try. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if the first medication doesn't work, if they're part of the 70 that don't get better, a lot of times they don't come back to give the doctor a second chance. And this is especially true with remote asynchronous care. We just don't have that engagement to get them back for a second try. So we really, really want to get it better, get, get them better the first time. At the very least, we'd like to do better than 30%. So AIs come on the scene and, and they're doing crazy stuff. Can I tell you the craziest thing I ever heard of an AI doing in medicine? So um, you can't tell the race of someone from their chest X-ray, okay? People's chest X-ray doesn't vary based on race. Right. They gave an AI thousands of chest x-rays along with the race and the AI figured out how to do it. Now that's impossible, but, but somehow it found structure within that data. So it, it's able to do things that human clinicians cannot. Human clinicians still do a lot of things much, much better, but there, there's this finding structure in data that the AI excels at. So one of the wonderful things about Hims and Hers is that we have our own electronic medical record. Um, we provide our own prescriptions through our affiliated pharmacies. So we have a lot of holistic data about the patients that we treat. Uh, so with that vast amount of data, what we did is that we asked the AI to try to match patient characteristics to medication response to try to get that above 30%. Uh, early signs are very, very encouraging, but this is a work in process. We're still in beta, um, and um, but I'm, I'm really excited about the possibilities. Yeah, me too. Sounds really exciting and interesting. Uh, can't hear, can't wait to hear more about what, what are the results. Hopefully, that is an academic I want to publish. You know, uh, this is going to be earth shattering if we can get it right. Uh, whether they'll allow me to publish is another question. One of the interesting academia in the private sector 
is that uh, there's a little bit more secrecy. Oh yeah, oh yeah, totally. All right, finally, uh, I ask at the very end our guests to give some kind of recommendations to other startup founders, and in your case would be for startup founders in mental health space. What would you recommend them to do? Yeah, so let me present a problem uh, that people face in this, um, in this area. Um, I read a quote from a VC. Now, let me just say right off the bat, I completely disagree with the sentiments expressed in this quote. I don't remember what it was, but he advised startups in health tech not to hire senior doctors. Really? And he said the reason for that is that senior doctors trained in the system that's broken that health tech people are trying to revolutionize. And what they will do is drag you back to the old broken system, whereas you want to go on and do something new. Interesting opinion. Yeah, interesting opinion. I totally disagree with it, <laughs> but, but it's a problem. I think you need the senior clinicians. I feel like I've been able to add a great deal to MedMatch. Um, you know, the engineers didn't have the background in neurobiology that I have. And so I felt that they were missing things that I could add. Additionally, medicine has a long, long storied history. Um, it's got a lot of traditions that are there for a reason. One of the, uh, you, you know, one of our, our, our core ideas is in the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. In tech, they say, move fast and break things. That's a conflict. That's a conflict. It's a conflict that you've got to be aware of. It's a conflict you've got to work out. You know, if you throw away, move fast and break things, nothing's going to change. If you throw away first, do no harm, you're going to be like Cerebral. Do you know Cerebral? Mm -hmm. uh, they're basically um, selling uh, amphetamines to anybody who wanted them. The challenge is to find the middle ground. The challenge is to find the way to bring it together. And I think that's what's most exciting. That's that's really cool ending of our interview. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.